Good evening, everyone. Uh, we have with us today two very esteemed journalists. I have to say it is just very serendipitous. I didn't realize uh, that we were doing that while putting the session together. I need you all to welcome Farah Bashir, who has made a lot of waves uh, and high ones uh, with her debut book called Rumors of Spring, A Girlhood in Kashmir. And she was just telling me before we we started the session that um, she's getting a tremendous response and a lot of people are just writing in with their comments, et cetera, for the book, which is amazing uh, because uh, I, I know how anxious you can get when you know it's your first book and you don't know how it's going to be received. So congratulations, Farah, for that. Uh, Farah has made her mark even as a photojournalist and she's used to work with Reuters. Presently, she's freelancing with communications and advertising. So for this episode of Right Circle, which is presented by Sri Simens in association with Prabhakitan Foundation and Siahi and Esas Women and Spagia, I welcome both you and Swati Vashisht, who is our Jaipur-based independent journalist, uh, again, a very keen photographer, very acclaimed for her role uh, when she was in CNN IBN, she was chief of Bureau of Rajasthan at that time, I think for 12 years. Wow. Um, but um, right now she is, oh, I keep, I keep forgetting this. I'm sorry, Swati. But yes, the very prestigious Maharaja Savai Ram Singh Award uh, also is something that she has claimed to fame for. Uh, apart from having her pieces been uh, featured in NPR and other such international online portals. Um, Swati is our moderator for today. And before I get off uh, video and off audio, I'm going to request each one of you present for the session to please send your addresses to, let me just get to the number, 995831244. Two seven within the next two days so that we can uh, dispatch a copy of Farah's book to all of you who are attending this session. With that, a very warm welcome to you, Farah, and to Swati. I'm going to and to our audiences. Thank you, Jaipur, for always being regular with Right Circle. You know, we have this community. We've built up a literary community in Jaipur, and they are very, very uh, faithful and they keep they are very active as well as you when you see the questions coming in uh, for us you're, you're in for a good time uh, so it's over to Swati and Farah for now thank you Meeta thank you so much for the lovely intro and thank you everyone who is attending today hello Swati hello hello Farah and uh, hello everyone and a warm welcome to this special session of the right circle before we begin the conversation, let me just take a moment to thank the entire team of the Right Circle for continuing to bring these sessions to us through the pandemic and for having me on board for this promising conversation with Farah Bashir on her first book, a memoir titled poetically and uh, just as poignantly, Rumors of Spring. This is what the book looks like with its uh, stunning cover. Farah, even before I finish introducing the book and before we sort of contextualize it, let me bring you in on the title of the book. Take us through uh, what informed your choice of the title. I read, I think, somewhere in the notes after the book that it's from a poem by uh, Aga Shahid Ali. And uh, also in terms of what spring symbolizes in Kashmir, which has such a harsh winter. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Swati. Thank you for that lovely intro and for introducing the book. To your point uh, on uh, the title of the book, uh, as you rightly pointed out, I, it, it's, a, it's a phrase from one of the translated poems by Aga Shahid Ali, uh, Rumors of Spring. And he was his poetry is something that most of uh, Kashmiris of my generation turn to. You know, he was about a, f a few years young, older than us. And... And he had that distance and he wrote poetry of what we all had experienced in the 90s. So when we were struggling to articulate our emotions, we would just go back, go to his turn to his poetry and read it and somehow just feel that, uh, that, that, that connection, that pain, that exhilaration. It did a lot to a lot many people. And 
for some reason, it this uh, phrase just stuck with me, and I've tried to uh, I before writing this book, before writing the memoir, I was trying to write two novels, which I obviously wasn't happy with, and I, and they didn't really see the light of the day, but the title remained, and. Uh, Spring, like you said, I mean, of course, it, there's a, this juxtaposition uh, of winter and spring, right? So there's harsh winter, but there's equally pleasant uh, summer in Kashmir. So uh, spring also connotes, I'm not taking it literally, but it also connotes hope, it connotes change, it connotes a pleasant time to come. It connotes all those uh, things which one looks forward to after a very bleak, harsh uh, cold winter uh, and long winter that too, that too. So yeah, that it somehow uh, just gave me the, the anchor. It really worked as an anchor to the book. And no matter the book changed forms from right. to memoir. Right. And uh, while there's much that's been written about and spoken on Kashmir from the standpoint of politics and conflict and violence, um, that it's torn by, what women go through uh, amid all of this rarely comes to the fore. The problem in Kashmir comes with its set of complexities. There are different stakeholders, multiple nuances and layers. Yet pain, perhaps, is the one consistent element that runs through the stories of people affected by conflict, whether it's the people in the valley who live in constant fear and siege, soldiers who sometimes return home to their loved ones wrapped in the tricolor, Kashmiri pundits who struggle to put behind what they've been through and live in longing to be home someday. Um, the other constant is that amidst all of these accounts, women remain conspicuous by their absence. The feminine gaze, so to say, is practically missing everywhere. And that is where Parabashi's book comes in to fill some of that vacuum. Uh, and that's what I feel is uh, what makes it a truly valuable book, Farah. Tell us what made you decide to write this book. You know, like you rightly said, uh, it's Kashmir is writ written about. It's 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 uh, it's a subject that has been written about for the last uh, 150 years by so many people, right? So uh, right from 1846 when Treaty of Amritsar was signed, and then there was 1931 uprising, and then the 90s, and a lot of people have written about it, some Kashmiris, some non-Kashmiris. But what I was, and when I was talking to my friends and some uh, you know, people I knew that I was working on a book and everyone would say, what's the new thing that you're going to write? You know, so much has been written about it. What are you going to write? And then I, I realized that how I grew up was not really, I haven't read that anywhere. And uh, the memoir has about 35, 36 odd chapters. And nine are about me. I mean, I find this a little bit of a limitation calling it a memoir because 14 are about other women as well, whether they were my aunts, my grandmother, my, uh, my mother's cousins, my own cousins, my friends. And how different women and girls uh, had very different coping mechanisms in those years of growing up. And if you really read these chapters, you see not two experiences are similar uh, in any way. Uh, I, for example, when I was growing up, I became, I sort of, I indulged in self-harm, which I wrote about in this memoir after much deliberation, whether I should write it or not. But it was important, but then there were other, my cousins, for example, they were very courageous in their, you know, in on the outside and they would, probably they would think of contemplate going outside and taking part in demonstrations sometimes. But I was a very scared kid at that point. So, and when you see different shades of women, I mean, you know, what is in the popular imagination, whether we see Bollywood or whether we see, you know, Kashmir has usually been broken into binaries and same applies to women. Right. Well. Yeah. It's like either very coy, shy, uh, Kashmir ki kali kind of a stereotype. Depiction, or, yeah. yeah. Or there is someone who is very fierce and aggressive. And what happens to girls, young girls, and how do they grow up? You know, and like we all know, South Asia is largely a patriarchal society. So you have to grow up with those uh, under that societal construct anyway. And on top of that, if you grow up 
amidst a conflict zone, in a conflict zone, amidst conflict. It's something that uh, is a very different kind of experience, which I hadn't, like I said, read anywhere. Yeah. Uh, and the memoir is a tender yet tragic account of a young girl from uh, Srinagar's Sherek House who finds herself in the thick of long lasting unrest as she enters adolescence through her turning into an adult in the 1990s. While it is told by a young girl uh, with disarming simplicity of an adolescence account, it is the untold story, as you point out, of uh, women across ages who are affected by conflict. It's rich in its anecdotes, but if you can share here maybe a, a couple of those which have left a lasting impact on you and also on your grandmother, how it affected her, because she, in many ways, is uh, right at the center of, of Sure. Uh, so uh, when you read the book, the opening chapter of the book is, is called The Day I Was Dead. I mean, I go to a, my sister and I went to a salon to get our hair done for Eid, which was uh, in a couple of days or the next day. And my and we go into the salon and by the time we walk out, everything had changed. There had been the first incident or event of firing very close to where we lived. And there was chaos and panic all over and a curfew was imposed uh, just a day before Eid. And we couldn't find a ride uh, home. And we had, we had uh, difficulty, we struggled to. By the time we reached home, uh, it turned out that a cousin of, a second cousin of mine had also been out with his father uh, shopping for shoes. But in that cross firing, he was hit by a bullet uh, on the side of his stomach. And he actually turns to his father and says, I'm feeling hot here. And it turned out that he was bleeding and he bled to uh, death on his way to the hospital. Ever since I'm not able to uh, celebrate Eid, uh, you know, there's, and it's when I was growing up, I really didn't know why I used to be so upset around Eid. Because I was around 12 and a half at that point. And as I grew older, I used to get really irritated and upset. And I, even now, I mean, two days ago, we celebrated Eid, Eid al Zuha, and I slept through it, most of it. It's still something now that I've processed it, I've even written about it, but it's something that, uh, you know, it, it's, you feel sort of trapped uh, by that event. It's, it's, it's something that I have not been able to shake off. Uh, I'm mindful about it. I think about it. I'm like, okay, it's been so many years, but there's something that uh, maybe it's the survivor guilt. I don't know. Uh, it could have been me, but it was him. So that was one incident. Uh, secondly, about, uh, and the same day, uh, we're actually interconnected. When I came home and since I had gone to get my hair done, I uh, thought it was whatever was happening was happening because of me. You know, the the imagination and the understanding of a 12 year old. So I started plucking out my hair and uh, that was a habit that continued for 28 years. I mean, there was one point when I was completely bald in front and I used to cover it with a scarf. I used to have all these floral scarves and I would just cover it with that. When I came out of Kashmir, I used to go to a uh, hair stylist and they'd be like, what happened? And I, I would make excuses and lie about, oh, chewing gum got stuck or something happened, I had an accident. And then I was like, okay, this is a problem that has, I mean, when I started sort of revisiting those days. So these two uh, very personal, uh, I mean, these two events had a very personal impact. Also, do you want to briefly talk about how it affected your grandmother? Sure. Uh, my grandmother was used to stay home most of the time. She was in her early 80s. And windows were something where she would spend most of her days. Either she would pray or help my mom with some, you know, maybe helping her chop vegetables. But I would usually see her at the windows. So we had a house which had many windows and it was, you know, by a narrow uh, street in old Srinagar, old city of Srinagar. And... Uh, when after 89, most of the times there would be tear gases on the street or uh, there would be, you know, uh, paramilitary patrolling or there would be demonstrations and sometimes the protesters would walk in and, you know, there would be chaos. So we used to keep windows shut most of the time for the first at least three years. And 
also in the old part of the town, the windows uh, have very little uh, like glass panes. They're mostly like wooden planks. So it yeah. used to be very dark inside. It used to become like a prison, like a very tall prison. And, and windows turned into like really these, like almost like walls. And for her, that was taken away. Uh, that the only connection she had to the world outside was taken away. And I don't know what it did to her, to be honest, you know, to be trans for her life to be transformed and completely changed overnight. And then she used to, she was, she was asthmatic. And, and I remember her being up at night and after the tear gases and the stress of firing and father sometimes not coming home or it, it just got aggravated in those four years uh, when she was alive from 90, when I, in the four years I talk about in my book. Right. Yeah. So yeah, those two things where she, and, and she was suddenly introduced to the, to a very foreign world. She didn't know a lot of things. She was dependent on us. You know, we, we are, we come from a region where when grandparents grow old, they're, they're adored and they're given a lot of respect. But here you see someone who had really, and she was very, very uh, progressive. She was very authoritative. And she, her existence was almost like diminished by where she was. And that was uh, something that was very painful to sort of bear in a, in a sense. Right. You know, you, this thing that you said about windows actually um, also in a way sort of brings us to the pandemic because it's shown us the importance of windows and to think that uh, to be without uh, opening your windows, uh, just how challenging would that be for anyone? And then for an elderly person like her who really depended on that, not just for her, you know, oxygen literally, but also in terms of like to keep that connection with life going. Uh, and, and this is a pandemic that's still not passed us and it's introduced us to lived experience, uh, to our lived experience, a lot of things that we never had experienced. It's a wide range of the good, bad and ugly. But the two sets of learning that seem to have stood out for most people are that it's shown us that life can, um, what life can be under multiple limitations and what it means to navigate life amidst constant uncertainties. In that context, you feel that people uh, outside the valley um, are now better placed to empathize somewhat more with those who, who live in conflict zones um, where these limitations have become an inseparable part of their lived experience for many years now? I get asked this quite a bit and uh, I mean the, for the book to come out during this time it's just very logical for people to make this connect like I mean I all there are also uh, on Instagram on the page uh, of this book you know you have readers who will talk about oh now we understand what it feels because you know we we've, we've been stuck indoors for the last year and a half and we've lost loved ones but the fundamental difference is Swati that um uh, when in the last one and a half years, everyone used to say, stay home and stay safe. But in Kashmir, being home did not necessarily mean that you were safe. You could have a crackdown. Uh, there is a chapter which is called Memory of the Lake, where there would be patrolling, uh, lake patrolling. and Night patrolling with those lights flashing. Light yeah. flash. and my, my young cousin, she used to keep sobbing and she, she was this little girl who would be scared of light uh, at night instead of darkness, you know, how we would grow up. So that was something that like homes didn't necessarily mean, uh, didn't guarantee safety. Right. Yeah. So it was much, uh, it's much worse, actually. You're right. But then I think somewhat it's kind of given everyone um, a glimpse of yeah what life can be like. You've shared your reasons for choosing to write this book, uh, but besides those as well, writing can also be cathartic and, and do you feel that it's been cathartic um, you know to have written about your troubled um, growing up years I I it's basically uh, any every time something happens back home whether it's uh, maybe the houses which are recently uh, being burned down after an encounter it reminds it constantly reminds me of my aunt who lost her house uh, in a similar encounter 
which was next door. So I believe it would have been cathartic had it stopped. And then I would have sort of processed those memories. One would have worked on them, written them, purged and catharsis would have followed. But it's something that, that's continuing and, uh, and doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any end or solution in sight. So I don't know if it can be cathartic because it keeps, and if it doesn't happen to you, it happens to someone in the known to you. Yes. You know, so it's, it, it always keeps coming back. Right. In fact, uh, one of the things that comes through in the book page after page is the mental health challenges that, um, that everyone seems to go through and women in particular, and uh, they sometimes manifest in psychosomatic symptoms. Um, you talked about one example and, uh, uh, and help as you detail is far from accessible. What does that do to an entire generation? Do you feel that people who saw the transition to this new reality were the ones who bore uh, the most brunt? Uh, actually, everyone. Even the ones who were born into curfews and this uh, post-90s also didn't have it easy. I mean, for us, the ones who saw the transition, uh, you know, even I was on uh, put on anti uh, like SSRI medication, antidepressant for uh, for what I mean, I used to get very confused at that point and be like, why is the doctor prescribed me? I'm completely okay. In my head, I was completely okay. Uh, but you see everyone around you, uh, while I didn't continue for the for a long time, but I've had aunts, I've had uh, uh, relatives who are taking it to this date. I mean, it's been about 20 years. And now you see younger kids. I was home uh, recently and I was talking to this journalist and I think Kashmir is on like one of the very few places where people own up to mental distress and having a mental, you know, whereas it's seen as a taboo everywhere else. So this journalist was like, oh, uh, something we spoke about mental health and he's like, oh, I'm, I'm a certified, I'm, a, I'm clinically uh, diagnosed bipolar. And he just said it so casually. So it's it's almost like acceptance and everyone knows it won't come as a shock. So youngster, he was probably, he's all of, uh, I think he's going for his master's. So yeah, like maybe mid -twi early twenties, early to mid twenties. And then you have my aunts, etc., relatives who are in their uh, early seventies. So it's, it's a large spectrum. What did it take to overcome some of that for you? you know, all that distress that you went through? Yeah, uh, I think a lot of faith. There are a lot of shrines in Kashmir and there were a couple where I used to go very regularly. And I wouldn't really pray there, but I would cry a lot. And somehow it just brought relief uh, from whatever the... So I wasn't... It was not... You know, when you're living in a conflict zone, you don't know that this is this is a difficult situation you think it, this is the way of life and this is how life is it's only when I moved to Singapore for studying and the contrast was so stark whether it was safety whether it was the way people live there whether it was the way women uh, were safe I think it just it was such a uh, it dawned upon me how how life can also be I mean and when I was growing up in Kashmir and my early 20s, et it just felt like this is what life is. So, right. yeah. You make references to some Kashmiri pandits at several points in the book. Um, that shows just how intertwined the lives were. Considering many of them were your friends, they were your teachers, some neighbors. How did this, their sudden absence uh, affect your life and the overall atmosphere in the valley? Uh, it affected me in terms of studies, uh, like palpably. I There used to be this girl in the classroom. Uh, she and I used to compete over who's going to be first and second and so on and so on. So when after uh, when our schools break for holidays, uh, winter vacation in 89, and then we went to school, usually the schools would reopen in March. But in 1990, they reopened in May for a few days. And then they were shut again after uh, some, uh, I think it was after the assassination of Molvi Farooq. So I didn't see her. 
I only saw her once the schools closed in 89. And when I went back, I didn't see her. And I somehow lost interest in studies, to be honest, after that, because it, she was, you know, how I was completely disoriented. So it, I, and my parents couldn't make sense of it. Uh, I mean, we really didn't, none of us made sense of anything that was happening. Uh, I was pulling out my hair by then. I had lost interest in studies. But it's only when you revisit and you make, you go almost like month by month, what happened and why did this behavior change? So long story short, it really disoriented me. Uh, there was also, my, my grandmother wanted me to become a doctor and she had, the her point of reference was our Kashmiri Pandit neighbor uh, who was studying medicine as well. And in 1989, the same winter, Rubaiya Said, who was, uh, the then Home Minister of India, Mufti, uh, Mufti Muhammad Mufti's Said. daughter, she was kidnapped. And I and she was, I think, interning at one of the hospitals. So as a young girl, a, I was going to follow Lakshmi Shri's, um, our neighbor's steps and become a doctor. And then a doctor gets kidnapped. So it was, I just didn't know how to articulate that incident. And I was very scared and we didn't really see their windows open after that incident. So they probably had left before the nineties. Right. Um, what have been the challenges of writing a personal account like uh, of the kind that you've written? And like you mentioned, you know, at one of the places in the group, your, in, in the book, your first crush gets um, cut short when it's just beginning to bloom into a long distance relationship for the lack of a functioning post office for Christ's sake. So, um, you know, was it, but was it tough uh, to open uh, your life to strangers and walk the reader through your personal space? I think I've been last few years, I've been reading, rereading a lot of women and it sort of gives you, it gave me courage to talk about, things that women from all over the world go through, whether you read African-American literature or whether you read Elena Ferrante's, you know, coming of age, regular childhood uh, books. So I did have someone tell me, like, what was the need to talk about your first crush or, or talk about your period? I'm like, but that it, it would really have been incomplete because it's a girl who is going through that age and it just happened and I wrote it the way it happened to me. But if I would have taken some of those details away, uh, I don't know, then it would have been a very different book. This way it's like, it's just, uh, and it was an attempt. I wasn't sure if people are going to react. No, I'm very glad that the details are there because that's what makes it so relatable. I was just wondering if it was, like, was it an internal challenge if, I mean, if you're a private person, then it is. And if you grow up in an environment like that, to talk about your life um, and to know that strangers will be reading about it. See, but, uh, in Kashmir, there's a strange, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, no, no, go on. Yes. No, uh, it's also like when you grow up in Kashmir, there's a sense that your life is being scrutinized from everywhere. So when I was growing up, I didn't really have that very, uh, you, I don't know if many people have that sense of, privacy and being private in Kashmir because you know you have a sense that the state is aware of everything that you're doing wherever you're going so somewhere fine eventually when you grow up and you know you 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 know what's right what's wrong and what what you should be talking about and what you shouldn't be but since I was writing from that girl's uh, lens and her perspective and her understanding, it just felt natural to talk about these things because I don't think she had any sense of, oh, I shouldn't be talking about it. It was like anyone can, you know, it's, it's, it was very fluid. There were no, right. you know, this is home and now this is private. It just felt very open. Right. Yes. Uh, besides all the tangible losses that, uh, that come to the fore very often, the book also takes the reader through the intangible ones the traditions uh, that are altering uh, because of the, the conflict, the truncated weddings. And this is also something a lot of my Kashmiri friends, including Kashmiri pundits, often feel pained about, even though in the larger discourse, it seems to take a back seat. 
would you say that some of these losses are just as irreparable if not more than the um as the tangible losses see uh this book also captures a time in kashmir uh which changed overnight a lot of rituals a lot of traditions completely vanished and and it happened very fast so it's also capturing those that uh and and you know it was a part of the the whole culture right and culture is what it's it's a huge part of your identity so and when we go back especially or people who when i'm there and you know i always go back to the old city where we don't live there anymore because it's somehow it's a loss which is like it's as painful as a tangible loss like you were saying because you it's it's it was that was home and it's it's unrecognizable now you know there were so many things that completely uh, changed which i talk about in the book whether it was addresses whether it was even just we are rice eaters so we used to store a lot of rice and we have these shared courtyards uh, in the old city so we used to clean rice for like days on end and that used to be such a without any festival it used to be so festive and it used to be such a lovely uh, week when that would happen those activities and that was completely gone so anything that uh lasted 2 3 days all those rituals were completely changed and on eid most of the eids are rested in kashmir there used to be a shehnai wala that used to come home he used to play clarinet and then he would my grandmother would just give him eid and i haven't seen him ever since it's been 30 years so there are so many uh, anchors of childhood and you know stability and and you know how you as a child feel they were completely those markers vanished as well it's sad and and i think people who've been born after that uh, wouldn't even know that something like that happened which is tragic yeah. you employ this a uh, rather interesting technique in each chapter where you juxtapose everyday unfolding of life with rude interruptions that bring traumatic experiences was that something that you did to convey the unpredictability that is stitched to life in a conflict zone or did it just flow like that because that's that's just how you went through it it was uh, deliberate uh, so i like i said the first chapter starts with that one hour that metamorphica where we walk into the salon and by the time we come out everything has changed so i wanted to sort of mimic that throughout the narrative and like you said life was changing on an hourly basis i mean this would have been a very uh, different book had i sort of copied what was happening it it, it wouldn't have waited till the end it would yeah. have been uh, like every two three paragraphs but it was largely to maintain that fracture uh, that we experienced in 89 right um you you write from the point of view of a young girl and the beauty of this book is that it doesn't seem to be in a rush to make this point or the other or to give a strong opinion about anything you talk about the intrusive crackdowns you also talk about how fundamentalist groups like the tarane milat um added to the constraints it's basically a glimpse into the lives of women at the peak of uh, insurgency uh how do you look back now at your growing up years as someone with considerable number of working years behind her who knows a lot more than what she did then i may have uh, had exposure outside etc to the world and interacted with different cultures different people but growing up in those years and f- feeling uh and experiences those experiencing those kind of circumstances for a young girl i really uh, borrow resilience and courage from that young younger self of mine you know in, in different aspects of life so it's it, it doesn't have to be war related or it doesn't have to be conflict related but general life issues and problems because i do remember one didn't sort of fall apart i mean i didn't have the ability for example to cry and i think i only cried after my grandmother passed away and my cousin was killed in between but i did i couldn't cry so and so it's it's a lot of there was and then lot- also i think it's when you when when you see it in the newspapers is when it, when it hits you you know it's 
when you're seeing yeah everything else it doesn't and then later it does yeah before i come to the final question is there a brief excerpt that you'd like to read out from the book sure uh, i'd like to would, uh, is is there something that you would want me to read or would you just leave it up to um no i think there are many so i think you choose it's just a tough choice because i think there are many moving portions of it sure since uh, the book is heavy and it does talk about uh, a lot of th- you know like the grim reality i would like to read uh, this uh, a couple of pages uh, from this chapter called hard goes boom boom i used to my sister used to listen to a lot of nazia hasan and uh, and i also grew up uh, listening to her while my grandmother wanted me to become a doctor i secretly wanted to grow up like nazia hasan and that also is a part of life uh, uh, so i'm going to read a page or two from there i'm glad you're reading that because that's uh, that's something that just made me instantly relate to this girl because that's the music that we were listening to here uh, okay so uh, this is page number 51 uh, Uh, so i'm reading it from the it's it's mid chapter i'm basically talking about what my parents had bought from hajj when my especially my father when he came back other than the expected tabarruk dates zamzam water skull cap and tasbih for relatives acquaintances and neighbors they had bought many other gifts for friends and family members among the paraphernalia crispy chocolate wafers were my fa- favorite the studded slippers were too gaudy for my liking and luckily a size too small so i never got to wear them for himself father had bought a large imported music system father didn't particularly have very taste in music he was fond of urdu ghazals by mehdi hasan kashmiri sufi kalam by gulam hasan sufi like afsos duniya kaisana lob samsar saiti and some soulful ones such as Rum Gayam Shishas Begur Gowa Baan Imyon by Raj Begum and the Seema Akhtar. In those days, my favorite was not so popular duet by Ghulam Hasan and Raj Begum, Walte Vesie Doks of Mashrif. Before the big music system arrived at our house, we used to have a small stereo with two basic functions. It had a cavity to insert a tape into it and an inbuilt radio. The new one had two spaces for tapes. an integrated compact display at the top and also a radio its edges were rounded and smooth not boxy like the old one it ha- it also had a deta- it also had detachable speakers all in all it took up a fair bit of space it stood out as one of the very few modern items in our traditional household father rarely let anyone touch the music system he was always around when he played it and after he was done he stored it back carefully on top of the cupboard he worried that if anything went wrong the spare parts would be exorbitantly priced to be replaced before my sister hena got married she take the music system out furtively and smuggle it into her room which was next to the empty chamber she'd get home from college late in the afternoon but several hours ahead of father's return from the shop Hina would listen to her own tapes. Her playlist included songs by Pakistani pop artist Sajad Ali, Hawa Hawa by Hasan Jahangir, songs and songs from Indian films like Tridev and Kayamat Se Kayamat Tak and Mr X in Bombay. Hina was very careful with the music system. She never forgot a tape inside and knew the exact angle at which father had stored it in the cabinet. Although initially she was apprehensive about letting me stick around during her clandestine musical afternoons. She came around after some months and let me into her surreal world. The only condition was I had to make make myself useful and not disturb her. So I'd pretend to prolong my homework and sit in her room with my books open. I was especially pleased when she played Young Tarang and Boom Boom by Pakistani sibling duo Nazia and Zuhay Hasan. I liked Nazia's singing and her signature nasal twang so much that I harbored a secret wish to be a pop singer. when i grew up and not a doctor like bob wanted me to become after hina got married father moved the music system to the lower shelves of the cupboard 
Not that he suspected Hina, but he was afraid of an imminent destruction of the system at the hands of angry troops at the time of crackdown. A fear that was more than understandable because a crackdown was nothing short of an out of body experience, no matter how many times one had been through it. Someone takes over your house without warning or permission, ransacks your bedroom, goes through all your things, turns your house upside down, and you're left either appeasing or pleading with them. The sound of boots on the wooden staircase would spark off a series of tremors in me. I would break into a sweat and panic so violently that I'd feel as if I'd vomit my heart out. The reaction of troops upon seeing the music system was usually, Iske liye paisa kahan se aata hai saale madar chut aap tak vadiyo. Pardon my language. That had instilled in father a deep fear. He was convinced that it was just a matter of time before they'd win their frustration on the prize position. It was a surprise that they hadn't already. Each time there was a crackdown, I muttered prayers, hoping that no frustrated trooper tossed or flung the music system onto the floor, even as they threw out utensils, clothes, books from the shelves, mercilessly when searching our kitchen and bedrooms. A broken music system would be a loss to me than to anyone else. Father had more or less stopped listening to music. He was always on the alert for anything amiss and perhaps that the relaxation from music would come in between him and what was happening on the streets. For his news updates, he had a small transistor radio that he relied on. When Hina got married, I stole one of her tapes, Young Tara, by Nazia and Zoheb Hassan. And it included a mashup of six of their best songs at the end of the album. Since school hardly ever opened, in, the, in those three years between 1991 and 93, I'd carry the stereo to a forgotten st storeroom at the back of our house, where mother kept large trunks full of her trousseau and seasonal clothing. The dense air of the room was suffused with the migraine inducing smell of naphthalene balls, but that never deterred me. During those secret afternoons, nothing could stop me from dancing to Nazia Hassan's Boom Boom and Disco Diwane. I'd pretend to hold a mic, swing my waist and hips, twirling while the air gathered under, under the crooks of my arms. I did that repeatedly until I felt sweaty, tired, and out of breath inside the dingy room. Panting, I'd step outside to inspect if the corridor was empty so that I could safely place the music system back into its original place. Much later, even after my heart had calmed down, the rhythm of boom boom, dil bole boom boom, refused to disappear. Thank you. Thank you so much for reading that. Um, and that brings us to our last question, uh, following which we can uh, open the session to some questions from the audience. From the point of view of someone who's had to sacrifice a normal childhood, share with us what the rumored spring will be like when it does come. I think uh, now it would be... Uh... Justice, truth to everyone, and then the actual peace that one would see after that. So, and otherwise, yeah. Amen to that. Thank you, Farah Bashir. It was truly a pleasure talking to you. And now uh, it's over to Urvi. Um, perhaps we can have some questions from the audience. Thank you, Farah. Thank you. It was a joy. Um, hi, everyone. Anyone who's got questions, you can either use the raise your hand option on the screen. We'll uh, unmute you and let you ask your question. Or you could also use the Q&A option on the screen and type in your questions to us. Uh, Mansi, would you take the first one already? Right, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so, uh, there's a question which asks, uh, would you like to write more books on the subject? considering that the problem has not been resolved till now. I'm working on a group portrait uh, after 95, uh, because this book ends at 94. So I'm working on a group portrait of women. Uh, and I just feel ordinary women, girls, are underrepresented anywhere. Uh, and especially in conflict zones, they become even more invisibilized. So yeah, the next book, would be on that and hopefully we'll see how that goes and after that. 
All right, all right. Thank you for that. Uh, in case anybody has any questions, you're requested to raise your hand. Um, Uh, yes, just a second. Yes. Yes. You talk of uh, the past as if uh, it is all over. Uh, my question was, uh, maybe you've grown out of it, but uh, what is it like for a 12-year-old, which you were, you know, when you've written this book, of that period. Today, what is it like for a 12-year-old girl to be living in Kashmir? Have things changed or is everything almost the same? Thank you. No problem. Uh, I, I'm talking of the 89 to 94. So that phase has passed. And it was a very different period when, uh, when there was like a proper war going on, right? So you had... Uh, armed insurgency uh, against the army so and the and the state of uh, rather the, the indian state so, or the indian rule so that phase uh, was a very different phase uh, in terms of things had changed overnight that 90s 89 the firing just changed the face of kashmir as we knew it uh, so that phase uh, doesn't exist uh, Today, uh, I have my niece is nine, and I see her. I see uh, glimpses of my childhood. Uh, for example, she the last time she's been to school was before was July 2019. Uh, I understand most of the kids in the world haven't been to school in a year, but for her it's two years. So she was seven when she was in school, or six and a half. She's now nine almost, and. Uh, I also see how she has blocked studies. She's really finding other ways to keep herself busy. She doesn't talk about her friends at all. And maybe when she grows up, she'll find her own, her traumas of her own. Like, why wasn't she thinking of her friends? I remember initially she would, she was very keen uh, to meet her friends and she would ask her grandfather, my father, to take her to meet her friends. But now she doesn't, I haven't really seen her this time talk about them at all. It's almost like she's blocked and she's most of the time spending time on uh, doing craft and spending time with on art and studies is something that she really has to get done with. I think we'll get to know their experiences when they grow up. So, yeah, I mean, I can only see echoes of my childhood. Okay, uh, so we have another question. Uh, my question is, how does your identity shape your writing and how does the history carried by the elders in your family affect your identity and in turn your writing? See, uh, our, my identity or people like me who grew up uh, in the 90s, our identity was really shaped by what was going on on a day-to-day -day basis, how we were experiencing things. It was not something that was passed down to us. It was not something that we inherited. We experienced it firsthand. Uh, so from, I don't know how, what my aspirations would have been had I not, or people like me, I mean, I'm just, uh, I'm just giving an example of me, but how like people who, a lot of people, uh, a lot of my friends, cousins, etc left Kashmir and went outside and studied there and worked there. I don't know if they would have wanted to do that. Or for example, a, a guy a guy who gets killed, I don't know what his, uh, how his identity would have uh, shaped rather than being a statistic uh, on the newspaper. So it was a very lived experience uh, and history was being made as we were living it. All right, thank you. Um, so we have another question. Um, 
which says, how would you rate your love for Kashmir in background of the experience that you underwent? It's, it's how you feel for home. I mean, for me, it's not an exotic place. It's home, you know, for the world outside. It's like a beautiful place that has gorgeous landscape, etc. For me, it's uh, where my parents live, where my family lives. So it's something that anyone would feel for their home, you know, like how anyone living outside when their home is a troubled place, how they would feel for it. And you just feel probably closer to it when it's not in the best condition. All right. Um, I think in on the same line, we have another question that how do you react to the clamping off of Kashmir under the present government? It's almost like Kashmir has been put out of sight to put it out of people's minds. It's been a very drastic, uh, there have been some drastic measures that have been taken in the last couple of years. Uh, when it comes to Kashmir, uh, things have changed unilaterally, have been changed unilaterally. So, and there's nothing much anyone can do uh, right now, to be honest. And, and in Kashmir's case, ever since I'm in my early 40s right now, and in the last, ever since I've been growing up or seen insurgency, or even before that, like insurgency didn't happen in a vacuum. There was massive election rigging that happened in 87, 88, that gave a rise to that. So all I'm trying to say is, Kashmir's uh, political landscape keeps shifting every four or five years. So right now, I think we're just, just holding our breath that nothing more untoward happens. All right. Um, so we have another question, uh, again, on the same lines. Uh, can you talk about how things are in Kashmir now, considering the pandemic and the very long lasting curfew that, has, uh, that Kashmir was under? Economically, very uh, uh, weak, uh, I would say. Uh, kids haven't been to school, so lack of focus in children uh, also. I mean, my nephew was around 20, 21. I have seen him before. I remember him before 2019. And I now, uh, he was like, a, he was a young, ambitious kid. And now I don't really even see him again talking about what he wants to do next after graduation. I think I catch this because I remember how I changed uh, my, in terms of studies, uh, how I changed, how that was the first casualty. I think this, these are the things which I pick up in, in people, in my relatives, in my family. Uh, so yeah, the overall population economically, uh, that, that they're not uh, as sound and and with kids, with youngsters, uh, it's, 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 it's an air of despondency, uh, I would say. Right, thank you. Uh, do we have more questions? Um, yeah, would we over to you? Super, thank you. Um, Thank you, Swati. Thank you, Farah. This was, uh, was a very enlightening session for all of us, I think, um, as is evidenced by everyone's questions also, I think, because we're also curious to know about the lives of everyone who's lived through the conflict and, uh, you know, just how it's been for everyone, because we don't know enough about it, I think. So it's, it's been very enlightening listening to you talk about this. Thank you so much, Farah, for sharing your story with us. Thank you. I think there's one question by Amandeep. Yeah, I was just coming to that. There's one question that's just come up. Uh, this is from Mr. Amandeep Sandhu. Would you ever write a nonfiction on Kashmir? Uh, this book is a memoir and it is nonfiction. So I'm actually trying fiction after this. But yeah, I, this is, this is nonfiction. So maybe eventually some another nonfiction book, but the next one would be fiction. Super. On that note, everyone who's attending the session, if you haven't already sent your addresses, you can send them to 99583-12427 uh, and we'll send you a copy of Farah's book. Uh, I'm sure all of you will enjoy reading it. I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, I haven't been able to get my hands on one right uh, yet, but hopefully very soon.
Uh, before I let all of you go, uh, I'd like to thank once again all our partners, uh, Prabhakatan Foundation, Shri Cement, SS Women, and the Spajaya Foundation. Thank you, Kwara, for taking our time and doing this with us. Thank you, Swati, as always. Uh, we will keep coming back to you as and when uh, for more sessions. Thank you, all of you, for taking time out on a Friday evening, joining us for this session. We will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ruby. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Ruby. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Farah.